Welcome to another episode of Investing Compass. Before we begin, a quick note that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your personal situation, circumstances, or needs. So, Shani, we did an episode on Beyond Meat, right? Remember, you know, fake meat, plant-based meat. Mm -hmm. And you made me go out and have one of those burgers, but you didn't have one. No, I was not going to have one of those. (laughs) Okay, well, it's important to maintain standards. <laughs> and we use that. It wasn't just about having the Beyond Meat burger. We use that episode as a case study to talk about how you could analyze the prospects of a company as an individual investor. And we actually got a lot of really positive feedback. So we got lots of emails and comments saying that they really enjoyed the episode. So we're going to do another one, not on Beyond Meat this time. So this time we're going to look at an Aussie stock that is also on our best ideas list. Yeah, and we really enjoyed doing that episode because we think that successful investing requires uh, being a student of business and take a rational view of companies' prospects. And it does allow you to keep your emotions in check as the market wildly fluctuates, which is a pretty tall order and easier said than done. But understanding what you're invested in and why you're invested in it is pivotal for a number of reasons. It acts as a north star when market volatility hits and nerves may waver and gives you the confidence to hold for the long term as an investor in a business and not simply a trader. Yeah. And over the past few years, there's been this influx of new investors in the market. And you know, maybe this will sound a little critical, but a lot of them, I think, are exhibiting qualities that traditionally would be more associated with speculators rather than investors. So speculators are focused on the short term, and they have an investment horizon that looks at quarters, not years. And even during recent earnings season, we saw a lot of large swings in stocks that at least our analysts didn't think were justified given their announcement. And this does happen every earnings season, but it seems to be getting more pronounced. And the speculative approach has also led to a surge in popularity for my favorite thematic ETFs. And many investors, of course, are just drawn to themes like lithium or cryptocurrency or innovation. And you know the list kind of goes on. But of course, investing successfully over the long term is much more than this first order thinking. It's much more than last quarter's results and chasing short term performance. And I think a good example of this is what's going on with Buy Now, Pay Later. Investors were enamored with the story or perhaps just enamored by the gains in the share price and flocked in. The share price went up and more people bought into Buy Now, Pay Later. And I don't think that a lot of people thought too much about the companies. And we did an episode where we said that these businesses didn't have a moat and that what they were trading for was outrageous and didn't reflect the reality of the businesses. And since then, we've seen more and more competition in that space, which has led to bad outcomes. So talk about this a lot. Competition involves erosion of pricing, heavy spending and marketing, things we don't really like as investors. And The share price performance since then has been dismal. So Block, which acquired Afterpay, is down 62%. Zips down 83%. Sezzles down 82%. And why did this happen? Well, there's lots of reasons. But part of this is a reflection of a lot of investors who didn't really think about the business and they simply wanted to believe the share price would keep going up forever. Now, in this case, I would say that our thesis was correct. And that isn't always the case. But what I will say is you should not invest unless you have a thesis, and you shouldn't invest without looking at valuations and what you're paying for the what you're paying for um, the risk that you're taking on. Exactly right, Mark. And at its core, investing is simply exchanging risk for potential return. As investors, we want to make sure that we are getting appropriately compensated for the risk we're taking on. And when valuation levels are high, there is inherently more risk in the market as there's less of a margin of safety and less room for increases in valuation levels to drive future returns. Sometimes as investors, it is common for us to be fixated on price movements, but the key to successful investing is not just buying an asset at a reasonable price, it's acquiring a quality asset at a reasonable price. So does this mean to invest successfully, you must dedicate your life to studying and analyzing companies to come out ahead? Of course not. But what we'll do is, just like last time with Beyond Meat, we're going to go through a few points to look out for with an Aussie stock that, as we said before, it's currently on our best ideas list. So, Shani, you want to tell us what the stock is? I know you've asked me this because you don't know how to say it, but it's Kogan. I say it wrong every time. <laughs> I keep saying Coogan. Kogan. Kogan. 
Kogan. And by the end of this, hopefully I'll know how to pronounce it. And also you all have a few pointers of what to look out for when you're looking for your next opportunity. So Kogan is a former high flyer and, you know, like Icarus Shani, you know, it is plunged back to earth. So incorporating a little bit of Greek mythology in here. And, you know, we'll start with the business, right? This is what we want to do always as investors, because first and foremost, we need to be interested in the company and the competitive environment with which it operates. And I would be hard pressed to find an investor or a consumer that has not heard of Kogan. Kogan is one of the largest online retailers of discretionary goods in Australia. Kogan offers a suite of services that range from the online retail services to internet and insurance, health, personal and pet. And it was founded in 2006. It's achieved eye-watering growth to become a company valued at about $650 million. And it's one of Australia's largest pure play online retailers, competing in the same space as Amazon, JB Hi-Fi and Temple and Webster. And its low price leadership underpins the business strategy. But like any company, it does not operate in a vacuum. Yeah. And as we've said before, capitalism at its best is, of course, competition, which benefits us as consumers. So companies compete on price and they try to create better products and services to win over new customers. And yeah, we benefit as consumers, but competition can also cause poor outcomes for investors as price wars and investments in marketing and product development erode margins and lower returns on investments. And the competition that Kogan faces is intense, but of course is not unique. And Amazon, of course, is one of their competitors and is a huge player in the global market and pretty much completely dominates the U.S. market. And it's continuing to make inroads in Australia. And what we saw during the pandemic really benefited Amazon and Kogan, right, that there was this shift of traditional on-premise retail shopping into the online world. But we have seen Kogan pivot in response to the competition that Amazon is bringing, and they've done this by finding a niche in heavier and bulkier goods. And the ability to operate nimbly is something to look out for in a company. It's a good characteristic to find when you're looking for something to hold long term, and that's because companies that are able to pivot and change or expand their market can protect their earnings and grow over the long term. But investors shouldn't just focus on the ability to pivot into new markets, but also companies that can protect and grow market share while maintaining robust margins and earning higher returns on capital. And that, of course, is an economic moat. And we do talk about moats a lot. So moats are, of course, a term that we've adopted from Warren Buffett. And it's been a while, Shani, right, since we played our drinking game. Mm -hmm. So for new people listening, the drinking game is pretty simple. We say Buffett and then you drink. So those are easy rules, right, Johnny? I think it's easy to remember. Yeah, even even I can pick up on that. Um, but what we look for is we look for moats in businesses, and that can help identify quality companies for investors. So at Morningstar, we've identified five sources of moats. Switching costs, which refer to obstacles that keep customers from changing from one product to another. The network effect, which occurs when the value of a good or service increases for both new and existing users as more people use that good or service. And then there's intangible assets, and that's things such as patents, government licenses, and brand identity that keep competitors at bay. There's also cost advantage, and that is when a company can produce goods or services at a lower cost, allowing them to undercut their competitors or achieve higher profitability. And the last one is efficient scale, and this benefits companies operating in a market that only supports one or a few competitors, limiting the competitiveness and rivalry that they face. And when we look at those five sources of moats, we don't actually believe that right now Kogan has any of them. So there's really low switching costs for consumers, so you can, of course, comparison shop, and there's lots of online competition from both Amazon and then omni-channel retailers. And omni-channel just refers to companies that operate both online and with retail stores, but have integrated those two channels. So basically, click and collect is the perfect example. So in our opinion, Kogan isn't differentiated enough from a product, shopping experience, or process standpoint to have an economic moat. But when we look at its main competitor, Amazon, We believe it does have a wide moat, meaning that it can maintain a competitive advantage over a period of at least 20 years. The difference between the two companies is that Amazon is a much more diversified business and has a longer history of disrupting the traditional retail industry. 
And for two decades, Amazon has steadily gained market share in retail, while also emerging as a leading infrastructure as a service or IAA, IAAS provider via Amazon Web Services or AWS. Yeah, and when we look at, and obviously those are different parts of Amazon, but when we look at their retail business, we think one of the most important things is their Prime membership. And Shani, you're a Prime member, aren't you? I am. How do you know that? You told me you were. Yeah. We discussed this. <laughs> I think we discussed this on a podcast before. Okay. Um, yeah. So Prime membership obviously gives you free and fast shipping, as well as access to Prime Video, Prime Music, and a variety of other benefits. So Prime subscriptions differentiate the user experience, and they're critical to attracting and retaining customers. And Kogan offers a membership service as well. Uh, the value that Prime offers, we don't think can actually be matched. So Prime customers are very sticky. They tend to purchase from Amazon more frequently and across more retail categories. They do. Like you're you're yeah. you're the prime just example, nodding. yeah, yeah. So what you're just you're one of the people that just classically just fell for this. That, so. and Amazon boxes show up every day, pretty much. Yes. Okay. Well, that's yeah. exciting. That's <laughs> exciting. So yeah, I mean, I think, and I don't know. Do you use? So the other thing is, of course, the content that you get as well. Do you also partake in that, Shani? Uh, not not really. I mean, like Prime Video is okay. Um, they do have grand designs, and I like to watch grand designs. So. Okay, well, there's there's another plus. There's another plus. So, That's about it. Yeah, so we think that these are pretty high switching costs for customers because they'd have to give all of that up, and it doesn't sound like Shawnee wants to give this up anytime soon. Mm. And evaluating a company's sustainable competitive advantage is one step of evaluating an investment. And we do believe, though, that Kogan has the early signs of building moat, and in the future they might get there. That's right, Shawnee. Our analysts do see traces of two moat sources – and those are cost advantage and network effect. But they're waiting to see if these moats strengthen as they're not entirely confident that either will provide durable over the next decade. And of course, our analysts will be closely watching this. So the first moat, cost advantage. So as we mentioned, Kogan started from scratch in 2016 as a pure play online retailer. And Kogan's process and associated cost advantage of sourcing direct from manufacturers and selling online allowed them to undercut a lot of their rivals on price. But a lot has happened since 2006. A lot of businesses have built lean supply chains like Kogan's. Direct-to-consumer efforts have increased, and traditional retailers have invested in strengthening their own online presence. And so this cost advantage has deteriorated since then. And we're not sure if they'll be able to hold on to it as the industry keeps moving on becoming more efficient, leaner, and direct. So, for example, we can look at TVs and JB Hi-Fi, which is currently Australia's leading consumer electronics retailer. They're focusing on that direct-to-consumer route, and they've launched an exclusive value TV brand called Falcon, that they, um, and they did that in 2020. And that second moat that we're seeing starting to develop is network effect. So Kogan's platform does have 2.3 million active customers, and that's, of course, nothing to scoff at. It's becoming more and more valuable to third-party brands and advertisers, but it's not close to reaching critical mass and a dominant network effect. So what we're seeing is that there was a sharp decline in third-party brand sales in the first half of fiscal 2020, and it showed that customers are seeking value and not just range. So really, the challenge for Kogan is... How much value can they get out of and how much can they retain this large network? And, you know, what value does Kogan get out of their relatively low operating leverage? We can also see through marketing costs that Kogan spent significantly more in marketing to acquire additional customers in the past few years. And this is completely contrary to network effect. The stronger a network effect, the less paid marketing costs to attract new customers. But on the positive side for Kogan, they are in the process of onboarding top eBay sellers onto its marketplace, and they also launched Kogan First, the membership program that we spoke about earlier. Morningstar Investor is built for investors by investors. It provides independent research and data on over 40,000 securities, tools to build and maintain an investment portfolio, and investor education resources to support you, regardless of where you are in your investing journey. Explore opportunities with our monthly global best ideas. Explore our ETF model portfolios. Plan better with two years of dividend forecasts for ASX listed stocks. And stay informed with independent thought leadership. 
We've built tools to help you construct, monitor, and maintain your portfolio, including our Portfolio Manager, integrated with one of Australia's leading portfolio tracking tools, ShareSight. Morningstar has been empowering investor success for over 35 years. We're passionate about your outcomes and are here every step of the way as you achieve them. Take out a free four-week trial to access our resources. Find the details in the episode notes. So no moat, but there are a couple that we think are starting to potentially develop. Our analysts just aren't entirely confident that they will remain in place over the next 10 years. But evaluating a company's sustainable competitive advantage is only one step of evaluating an investment. Although they don't have a moat, we still expect Kogan to boost high returns on capital, and we attribute that to the structural tailwinds in the industry. And that's of shoppers switching from bricks and mortar shopping for, to online shopping, the ramp up of Kogan's marketplace, and still being a very capital light business. So ultimately, these all seem like they are emerging versions of Amazon's competitive advantage. So businesses, of course, do not operate in a vacuum. It's important to look at the environment in which they're operating in and whether the trends that we see are conducive to business growth. And we mentioned buy now, pay later earlier and talked about how investors became enamored of the growth and simply projected it into the future. They had incredibly high expectations for the future and the share price reflected those expectations. When those expectations, those impossible to achieve expectations, weren't met, the share price got crushed. And we've said this before, but how a share price is not how a company performs on an absolute basis, but how it performs in comparison to investor expectations that are baked into the share price. And if we look at retailers, so for retailers, when COVID hit, everyone decided that retail shares were one of the best places to own. So the theory was that people would be in their own homes, they'd have nothing to do or spend money on, so they would just shop. And guess what? That happened just as everyone suspected. And then, of course, guess what happened? Sales skyrocketed at a lot of these retailers, and investors decided that these inflated sales would last forever. Or once again, maybe they just didn't think too much about this and just chase the share price. And we'll talk about this in a second, but guess what? For many of these retailers, including Kogan, then they just plunged in value when sales went down. And that was because high expectations couldn't be met. But in our view, we see the pandemic was a catalyst in many ways. Retail shoppers were saving more during lockdowns and had more to spend. And many businesses had to operate purely online due to lockdown mandates and reformed their business models. But we believe the popularity of online shopping is here to stay. Now, we have explored the competitive landscape, but we really see that Kogan is hopefully an emerging David to Amazon's Goliath. They are steadying their foothold in the online retail space and will benefit from the secular shift that we're seeing into online retail. And this is a good opportunity to focus on valuation and compare what we think Kogan is worth in relation to how much the market is valuing the share price. And this leads to price. As we said in the last episode, we believe that price should be looked at after determining the type of business that you're investing in. And as it's on our best ideas list, we think that the market has mispriced Kogan. Investors collectively believe that Kogan's earnings growth prospects peaked in late 2020 when the share price was around $25. Since then, shares are down almost 70%. As investors, we need to determine whether this is an appropriate reaction and whether the underlying business has deteriorated enough to justify such a calamitous drop. Yeah, that's right, Shani. And as you said, as Kogan's inclusion on best ideas on our best ideas list indicates we strongly believe that this is a case where the baby should not be thrown out with the bathwater. The market seems focused on the near term, while we believe that Kogan has a strong outlook for long term revenue growth. The pandemic brought a good deal of operating volatility to retailers, as we mentioned. So all retailers, big and small, were impacted by the opening and closing and opening and closing of retail during various lockdowns. The earnings growth early in the pandemic produced difficult comparisons for Kogan and other retailers as well. However, we think going forward, we see earnings growth for Kogan as strong, especially relative to the broader market. And the short story is that we thought expectations were too high after the initial surge in sales during the pandemic. And after sales came back to earth, the share price collapsed. We think they are way too low right now. 
Yeah, and low expectations can be a good thing because they're, of course, a lot easier to beat than high expectations, which, of course, is the story of my life, Shani. <laughs> so Kogan is Australia's largest listed online pure play retailer, as we said, and because of this, it's poised to benefit from the structural shift that we're seeing in retail sales. So we expect the online segment of the retail market to grow strongly and outperform the traditional brick and mortar channel by an average of five percentage points over the next decade. We also estimate Australian online sales to increase at a compounded annual growth rate of 9% to over $100 billion Aussie by fiscal 2031. And we compare that to a 3% growth rate for brick and mortar sales. So we forecast over 20% of all retail sales will be transacted digitally by fiscal 2031. And that compares to 13% now. We just think that Kogan is in a great spot to benefit from this acceleration. And the underlining business is strong and can capitalize on this. And there are two elements to growth in earnings, the top line or revenue growth and how much the company gets to keep, which is reflected by the margin. In Kogan's case, we expect sales to increase over the next five years by 5% in the compound annual growth rate, but margin expansion to lead to earnings growth of 14% growth rate. And we mentioned that increases in marketing spend before, but we think margins have been pretty heavily depressed by this marketing spend as Kogan's, Kogan spent 70% more than sales. They also faced higher warehousing costs as inventory swelled, and we see both starting to scale back in 2023 as the retail environment stabilizes. And when we look to the future, we see a couple catalysts for Kogan's share price including the stabilization of sales growth, a recovery in margins, and potentially a reinstatement of the dividend. So our estimate is fairly conservative compared to what management is promising, which we think is more aspirational than realistic. But that being said, it does provide an opportunity for significant upside if they can grow sales while maintaining their margin. All in all, we believe that there is a secular shift to e-commerce and that Kogan can both protect and grow their market share. The surge of sales during COVID has dissipated, but the market has overreacted to the drop as consumers have shifted their spending after lockdowns ended. We do think that there is value here. And Kogan followed this pattern. So there was earnings growth. Um, their earnings growth peaked in 2020 with sales growth of 110% in August of 2020. And the market, as I said before, expected this sales growth to just continue. And at the time, we thought this was unrealistic, and we had a price to fair value of 1.65, which indicates that the shares were 65% overvalued. And the reaction in the share price since then, we also think has been overdone. And we see it being a bargain right now with a fair value of $11.70, which is more than 50% higher than the current share price as we're recording this. And we've spoken about margin of safety before, but this is something that also goes into our ratings methodology. And margin of safety was something that was introduced formally by Ben Graham in Chapter 20 of The Intelligent Investor. And the basic concept is that even if you have a pretty good handle on what a stock is worth, you still need to build in a buffer. This buffer accounts for imprecision in the calculation of the fair value, which comes from the fact that humans make mistakes. And the future, of course, is unknowable. The margin of safety allows you to sleep a little bit better at night as an investor. Yeah, and we believe that there is a pretty significant discount here, and it's more than an adequate margin of safety for investors to take a chance on the company. And that means that as we record this, the price that Kogan is trading at around $5.05, along with the other inputs into our rating methodology, makes this a five-star stock. So that is it, Shani. We did it. It's St. Patrick's Day. So is. this is our- I'm just not going to see Mark after this. He'll be at the pub. I mean, you could come with me if you wanted. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you guys very much for joining. I managed to pronounce Kogan correctly throughout the entire podcast, which is my accomplishment for the day. So we would love ratings on your podcast app. And if you have any questions or comments or show suggestions, please send an email to me. It's in the show notes. Any advice in this podcast is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situations or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.